All right, thank you. I'm just going to say a few words before I go through the slides. I'm really fascinated by engineering mistakes. That's driven my career so far at MIT. That's my primary research area. We've been developing techniques to help engineers recognize and prevent their mistakes. We also need techniques to help testers figure out what to test. Of course, engineering mistakes is right at the heart of what we do, right? A lot of my work happens to be in safety critical and security critical systems where these mistakes are the most costly. One of the first things people ask after an accident, how in the world did that get through testing? Why didn't they test that? When you see one accident, then you see a second accident, and the same question comes up in the third and the fourth, and then hundreds of accidents, and the same question comes up. You start to think, it wasn't just one stupid tester here. We've got a broader issue. <clears throat> you start to see a pattern. It's often that we have smart people trying to do their job, but they're handicapped with methods that don't target the kind of problem that we have, or without the proper methods to find that critical thing to test before an accident. And from a leadership perspective, the types of procedures and methods and resources and techniques that we did put in place did not set them up for success. Not that we were malicious, everyone's trying to do their job, but it's what we don't know that gets us, right? Both for testers and engineers and for leaders. So we really need techniques that can help us do a better job managing complexity. I'm including complexity of a technical system, that's a big problem, but what about the social, socio-technical system? We need techniques to analyze that. I've seen a lot of test hazard analyses and engineering safety analyses. They always look at what if this thing fails, let's inject a failure here. Where is the analysis of the test organization and the test leadership? I don't think anybody will claim in the safety critical system test leadership is not important. We all know it's important, but it's never analyzed. We don't have methods to analyze it. It's very, very ad hoc. Sometimes testing is very ad hoc. That's not always a bad thing. I love uh, working in an ad hoc environment, but when, we, when you're doing an application that's safety critical with lines on the line, that may not be enough. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a technique to do exactly that, to handle complexity in fully autonomous vehicles and other advanced systems that we're building, the technical complexity, but also human complexity and how humans interact with those systems. That's a big gap. A lot of times when we test systems, we think that we're testing just the technical piece with the human removed. I don't think that's our job anymore. We've got to test how to, because they're, they're related. We can't just throw things over the fence and expect a human factors group to handle the human. These two things affect each other. We've got to test how systems affect humans, not just how humans affect systems, and how they can induce human error. Human error is no longer a property of the human. It's a property of the system we put them in. And that's true for leadership as well. To be successful, we've got to manage complexity. Engineers and testers are very consumed with all the nitty-gritty details. That's what we do well, but we often miss the forest for the trees. So a key objective of the technique that I'm going to show you has become very popular. It's now in industry standards. Um, is all about managing complexity. Here's a block diagram. This happens to be for a satellite system, but the detail doesn't matter. We're really good, engineers and testers, really good at looking at this thing, picking apart the details. Should that really be connected here? What if I inject something over here? Uh, that's good, but it's also how you miss things. And it's not how you manage complexity for very large systems when you've got thousands of pages of this. So here's the key insight for the technique I'm going to show you. Recognize, first of all, we've got to enable abstraction. That's how humans deal with complexity. Systems theory comes from psychology, comes from so cognitive science. Everybody's in agreement. We've got to abstract. But how do you abstract effectively? Well, in this satellite system, you can say, hey, this group of stuff right here, that's the stuff that we're trying to control. That's the physical stuff that moves the aircraft about. And we've got different ways to do that. Let's group that stuff together. We'll call it a control process. And hey, this group of stuff here, there's some coordination. There's a lot of details. But as a, together, as a functional group, that's basically a controller. It's a functional controller. It may not exist that way in the, on the silicon, but it's a functional controller 
It, and we have a control relationship here. So let's try using control loops to abstract. One of the problem with traditional thinking is we tend to focus on one component by itself and what gets left out? The interactions. We miss the interactions. It's critical. I'm going to start, by the way, at the technical detail. I'm going to quickly move all the way up uh, through this presentation. Uh, the same principles apply to humans as well as to management. So we have a set of controllers here. This happens to be maybe a piece of software. What do controllers do? Well, controllers provide control actions, right? They make decisions, outputs, instructions, try to achieve a goal. There's a control process. Controllers often receive feedback, not always, but usually it's required to be stable. You have to understand what is the effect of my control action, what's going on in the system. And if the feedback is incorrect or incomplete or misleading, we can have some problems, or if it's delayed. There's a key piece of every controller in the world called a process model. This comes from control theory. Basically what it says is controllers have a belief about the world around them. And if that belief is incorrect or mismatched, that's a classic way that controllers do the wrong thing. They provide incorrect control action. Control algorithm, that's kind of a software uh, term, but it says, given what I believe, what do I do about it? And maybe the control algorithm could be flawed. Okay? So this is a higher level abstraction to think about the bigger picture. This maybe is a better starting point than this. In fact, and we can go through, there's some uh, definitions we can go through. I, I don't think we need to spend much time on this. I'm going to have to go a little bit fast paced, but know that there's a lot that I'm kind of skipping over in this technique. Of course, in real systems, we don't just have one control loop, do we? We have a hierarchy of control, right? And it's different. The process model believes. Uh, and the information and so on, and the goals are different at each level in the hierarchy. So here we have physical uh, actuators that you move around to move the spacecraft. This guy uh, says, uh, figures out how to point to the new direction in space. It's not smart enough to figure out where to, we should point next. It just figures out how to do it, how to actuate it. And it's going to have certain beliefs at this level, and we might think about how this can cause problems in this control loop. But at the higher level, we've got a navigation controller that doesn't know how to actually do it, but it knows where we should point next or tries to figure that out, right? They're going to have different beliefs, different types of feedback, and potentially different flaws. Really interesting thing that we've got to get better at is the non-failure problem. When we're so focused on individual components and individual component failures and failure injection and those things, that's, that's one piece of the problem. But what if the system works? What if everything works as designed? And that's the problem. How do we catch that? Other than just having smart people look at it. We need more rigorous ways. As systems are getting more and more complex, this is what's causing most major accidents in the last 10 years. The thing was designed that way. We've, so we build, on the right, what's called a control structure. It's a hierarchy of control. It's an abstraction, a functional abstraction. The vertical axis indicates something. It indicates control. So boxes towards the top have more control and authority over boxes towards the bottom. That means that every downward arrow is going to be a control action. It's going to be an instruction, an output, a directive to try to achieve a goal. Every upward arrow is going to be a piece of feedback, a piece of information about what's going on that the controller needs to use to do their job. And we can think about flaws, not just uh, sensor failures and component failures, that's one cause of, of incorrect feedback and a process model flaw and a bad decision. But what if there's no flaw in the sensor, but we never had a sensor there to begin with? We never thought that this piece of feedback would be important. It was missing. We care about that too. What if we put a sensor in there, but it was the wrong type of sensor? Or it didn't have the right resolution, or there was a delay because we put it over Ethernet to use commercial off-the-shelf devices and all these things. We have got to really get better at this. It's well within the domain of testers. It is, engineers should get it right, first of all, but it's also our job to double check and find what they missed. In fact, if, while we're on the topic of abstraction, why should we start here? Why don't we start putting this entire thing in a box and say, hey, let's call that an automated controller. And before we dive into the details, because we might not know what we're looking for, let's think about this control up here and who controls the automated tester, I mean the automated controllers. What kinds of control actions do we have to accept and how could those control actions cause us to do something unsafe? What kind of information do we have to provide to operators and if we do it wrong or misleading or conflicting or delayed or whatever, how can we mislead them and actually induce human error? more and more important. Maybe we should start here 
because we don't necessarily know what we're looking for in the more detailed level if we don't start here. While we're at it, and by the way, this is the different betwe difference between a component-based view and a systems-based view. You've got to get better at a systems-based view. In fact, this control loop works very well for software, one of the two biggest challenges we have in, in safety-critical systems today and things that we're missing. Software behaves. It works very well. Software controls have a belief, and that explains a lot of accidents that we're having. By the way, it's not all about beliefs in this technique. It's just something that's easy to latch on to. What about humans? Hey, we can understand human error this way, too. I hate the word human error because it sounds like it's the human's fault. But you all know what I'm talking about. What if the human, we call it an unsafe control action, a very factual statement. What if they provide something because they believe that was the right thing to do? How could they come to, we should be asking ourselves, how could they come to believe that that was the right thing to do and say, well, recognize that those beliefs come from feedback, among other things. Feedback that our system is providing. How could our system do, that should be a test scenario. Let's see if it's providing the right feedback. So this works for the second largest problem we've had uh, recently causing accidents with human behavior. In fact, why should we start here? Maybe we've got a whole joint, whole fleet of operations to think about. There's a massive coordination problem here. Before we get into the details and necessarily know what kind of behaviors actually matter, what kind of feedback do we have to provide up to the uh, joint command of the fleet? And what kind of coordination problem do they have to deal with? And could we provide conflicting information to make their, problem, their job much, much harder and induce error at that level? In fact, we should have really start here. This is basic system engineering, but that's not always how testing works. Uh, so it's well recognized that this is a, a, a way to manage complexity, but it's not uh, totally injected into the safety, into this testing community yet. Now there's a little bit of uh, 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 details in the method. I'm just going to go quickly just to give you a, a taste. We can define uh, four categories of control actions that are relevant for unintended behavior of the system. We can have a control action that's required, but it's not provided. Think about a brake command in a, in a car. You don't provide the brake command. Could that be dangerous? Yeah, in some situation, it could be dangerous. You don't stop for an obstacle. What if you provide case two, a brake command? Could that be dangerous? Sure can. You do it on a highway. In an aircraft, you do it on an active runway and come to a stop. What about case three? Maybe you provide the exact right command in the right situation, but it's delayed a little bit. Three seconds too late. Yeah, we care about those as well. And in case four, what if you provide a brake command, you do it at the right time, in the right context, but you let go too soon. Immediately let go of the tree. Well, that's another way. This is derived from accidents that we've had over the last 20 years. It's provably complete. There are subcases for these reviews. You may be thinking of some subcases now. A lot of them fall into case two. Anyway, so we can start to build a method out of this to try to anticipate these things, build test scenarios, and try to find flaws in the design to look for. This technique is called STPA, System Theoretic Process Analysis. The idea is to treat testing not as a failure problem, not as a component-based problem, but as a control problem. Different way of thinking. Controllers use a process model. This works really, really well for software. Very, very complex software, AI, machine learning. The smartest people in the world don't know what those coefficients mean by looking at them and, and exactly how they got there, but we can abstract that, that piece machine has a belief, doesn't it? It's going to form beliefs. If it forms the wrong belief, that's an explanation for this. We, so we can f identify causes related to component failure, component interactions, human behavior, software behavior, design errors, flawed requirements. Big thing in testing is requirements-based testing, isn't it? Guess what kind of accidents we're having? Accidents where the requirements were wrong or missing. How do you catch that? That's really difficult to catch. Part of our job needs to be finding the missing requirements that no one else thought of, and use those to drive a test case. Don't just prove what the engineers assumed to, to be true. Uh, don't just assume what the engineers assumed. We've got to question that, right? Here's a PhD thesis that we had a couple years ago uh, for the Air Force Test Center, where I just came from yesterday, in fact. I've been using this for a few years now. You could build a control structure for the testing group. In fact, we've been talking down here. Maybe you have an aircraft, maybe an autopilot, maybe a pilot. There are control loops here that are very important, and we've got to think about those interactions. Who controls the pilot? Well, we've got operating procedures. Sorry, pilot would be, we've got, we've got pilots and test pilots. Who controls the pilots? Well, we've got procedures that we put in place. We've got air traffic control. Over here, we have uh, instructions, and we have uh, engineers that do a test plan. 
uh, and they review that and so on. How many of you have ever worked for a manager or supervisor that was incompetent? <laughs> if they're in the room, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I think we all have. <laughs> now look, you've got two reactions to this. Is the component-based view and there's the systems view. Component-based view says, that guy's an idiot. How did he get in his position? Now, unfortunately, I don't have control. Maybe I should get him fired. Maybe he needs to go. Maybe I just have to get out of here. But this is a really bad situation, and, and it, that's the component-based view base. What's the systems-based view? What does this get you? Let's step back a minute, all right? Let's not be judgmental. Let's not say human error. Let's not say that they're malicious and so on. Let's be factual. What was the control action that the manager's providing that was undesirable or unsafe? Well, well, factually, let's state it. We we'll call that a control action. That's a downward arrow. Now, more, most often, they were trying to do their job. They were trying to achieve an objective. They thought they were doing the right thing. Let's try to understand why. What kind of belief did they have at the time that made them think that was the right answer, it made them think that was achieving their goal? What was their process model? And once we identify the process models that may or may not match reality, where do they come from? They don't come out of the blue. They don't flip a coin to come to a belief. There's some information. And where's a primary source of information? It's feedback. Where does feedback come from? It comes from us. So you might think, what kind of feedback have I been providing that either did not correct the process model flaw that was there, or maybe created it in the first place, or maybe was conflicting or contradictory in some way? And what can I do to fix, at a system level, this kind of behavior? That's questions we've got to ask. So it's the same thing that I've been talking about down here. It applies up here to management. You can go all the way up to Congress and I can share some interesting stories there, but I don't have time. So boy, do we have some inadequate uh, and unsafe control actions up there. Um, all right. Now let's get back to, let me show you some examples of all of this. Uh, we have a student project. This is a uh, student uh, in our class that we teach on this technique on system safety and testing at MIT. We had a couple of students and they applied this technique. They chose uh, a, something inspired by Tesla Autopilot. I've been advised it's a, it's a good way to put it. Um, so let's see what they did. St here's the process. You've got four steps. I'm, I apologize that I'm going to go through very quickly, but maybe it, it'll uh, place the hooks for you to be inspired to learn more if you're interested. Step one is what, are the, what is the purpose? Uh, what are the losses that we want to prevent? We've got to have some goal to begin with. Otherwise, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we want to prevent loss of life. That's the traditional safety objective. What about damage to the vehicle, but we don't kill anybody? Yeah, we care about that. What about loss of mission? There's always a loss of mission. What if we don't kill anybody, we don't damage the vehicle, but somehow this automation doesn't get you to point B or makes you more efficient? Yeah, we care about that, customer satisfaction. So in this method, you can apply not just to safety and security, but to any loss. And the stakeholders get to define the loss. Okay, now we build a model. The model is going to be a functional control structure. Here's a very simple one that we can cover in the next 15 minutes or so. So here we have a driver at the top making some high-level decisions. They can do, execute manual commands to the vehicle. They can enable or disable the automation. This is a lane management system, a generic title for this type of automation. The, the automation, the software here can change lanes. It can accelerate. It can brake. Much simpler than what we're used to dealing with, isn't it? Let's see if this can get you anything useful. So what we do, uh, notice the control is on a vertical axis, so the downward arrows are the control actions or the outputs. Let's start there. That's the next step of the process. We identify what's called unsafe control actions. Uh, by the way, the word unsafe, we've defined it to mean whatever the losses are. For, and it's not just us. The Mars Polar Lander that NASA sent up to Mars, unmanned, no people. They had a huge safety department looking at hazardous scenarios. What? There's no people. What are they doing? Safety for them is loss of mission. Just don't be misled if any time I slip up and say safety, hazardous, or, or words like that. I mean any loss. So let's identify unsafe control actions. Well, what's one control action? We've got a break command coming from this lane management system. Remember the four ways that a command can be unsafe? What are the things we, that it, somehow we've got to have controls in place to prevent this behavior? And in testing, we want to try to get this behavior to happen uh, to show if it's unsafe. So what can, how can not providing a break command cause a problem? What do you think? You hit something. If you don't break when there's something in front of you, 
There we go. That's how we would write it. We tag these. It's called UCAs. This is UCA1. This is an output. LMS does not provide break command when vehicle path is obstructed. This links back to the losses that we started with. Every result in this process has full traceability, so you know where these things came from. This statement is not just something you, you write down and um, um, uh, ad hoc. There's a structure behind this. I don't have much time to go over, but the first part is always the source controller. Then we have the type of control action we're talking about. Then we have the command and we have the context. Context can be further refined. Um, anyway, there's a lot of structure here that I'm glazing over, but I want to give you a case for it. That this structure is in place to make sure we're very carefully going through the system to see what needs to be prevented. Okay, but I haven't blown your mind yet with this UCA. It's something we already already know. We would go through this table, find the others. Let's move on. Let's go to step four, which is to identify scenarios. All right, we've got these control actions that must be prevented somehow. Uh, we can immediately, by the way, get some requirements out of those. So every one of those should be translated into a requirement to prevent that behavior. If you already have a set of requirements that they gave to you, you should be checking those and say, how does it compare? Do we have requirements to maybe cause that behavior? Nobody realized it. Do we have a missing requirement? It conflicts and things like that. Let's move on, though. Now, once we have that behavior, even if we've got the requirement in place, um, we need some insight. We can't just test every possible combination and see if, the, if this thing is going to happen. Let's try to figure out exactly how this behavior might come out of the computer. And we use a control loop like this. Some annotations here in black is a common template you can use to build these scenarios. So we start with the UCA, which is the output of the controller. It doesn't provide adequate breaking commands when there's an object in your path. What kind of belief in the process model, what kind of belief would cause that? We're humanizing the software, by the way, which is fine. It works very well. What do you think? Well, if it doesn't see, yes, I interpret the word see. That's feedback. You're absolutely right. We're going we're gonna to go one step at a time, though, just to make sure we don't miss anything. It's kind of easy in this case, but what, use the word belief. If it believes what? If it believes there's nothing in the way. Now we can say, okay, we come up with a number of beliefs. There will be a, a small number, by the way, because we're not talking about inputs, maybe hundreds of inputs. A small number of beliefs, and we say, okay, for each belief, what kind of inputs would cause that belief? All right, well, what kind of inputs would cause this? Well, maybe there's a radar on this car. Maybe there's some other sensors. And we can immediately say, well, if the sensor fails, that's a pretty obvious one. Uh, what if there's rain, fog, and other things? What about a beautiful sunny day? Nothing fails. Nothing loses power. Everything's working exactly as designed. How can a radar sensor in a front bumper not see an obstacle? Miscalculation, yes. That might be a flaw in the algorithm. So signal interference, yeah. There could be maybe something in the path, right? Some obstruction. That's going to happen, isn't it? It's driving down the road. It happens all the time. Okay, so these students, I'm going to cut to the chase now. Here's what these students found. By the way, this was just in a couple of days, and they had almost no information about the actual system. Uh, and these students had no experience at all. Let's see what they found. Uh, they depicted graphically. They said, okay, here's your car, which may be something like a Tesla. It's driving down, and it's a human driver, and there's your obstacle. Hey, if you've got this, there's something in the way. You're not going to see the obstacle. Now, it gets worse. Now, you're driving along, but a human driver, what do you do when you see an obstacle? Maybe get out of the way, right? Now, what? now it would be great if you check your blind spot first. What if you check your blind spot? <laughs> what if you check your blind spot and someone's in your way? What do you do? Break, maybe speed up. So there's going to be some delay before you get out of the path. What if you get the student said using this method? This was in 2016, by the way. The what if there's a delay in getting out of the way, and this car is just looking at the car in front, and at the last second it sees the obstacle? What could happen? The thing could crash. How how good of a test scenario do you think this might be? This sounds great to me. It sounds like this is going to happen. Where are the controls for this? Has anybody thought of this? This was in 2016. So when we saw this, we said, you've got to present this at a conference. We presented it in March of 2016 at the MIT conference. I'll mention on my last slide, you're all invited, by the way. It's a free conference. It's all about this technique and industry uses of it. Um, and they presented it. And then a little while later, we had an accident just like this. And then uh, the manufacturer, very bad press, and they spent a long time with the highest paid engineers in their company trying to 
figure out a solution after the product is already sold. What are you forced to do at that point? Some kind of software change, some kind of work. But the radar, the thing is already on the car. It was never designed to look more than one car ahead. By the way, as human drivers, I don't know if you realize, we have a tendency to look through the, through the window. We can't look through the window. We have a tendency to go to the side just to see two cars ahead. We do it all the time. Not this one. That's not how radar works. No one talks. That, that might be important. So, so he found a way after a long time how to, to bounce, to reprogram the thing, do something it was never designed to do. Bounce that beam under the undercarriage of the car in front. On certain conditions, you know, around turn is not going to work. We don't have any turns, though, do we? Or it, <laughs> uh, certain weather conditions, it's not going to work, and so on. But sometimes it'll hit a car in front, and it'll bounce back, and the return is one over r to the fourth. So it's really hard to do. This doesn't work a lot of times, but sometimes it might. And it's a huge amount of effort. What would it take to figure this out before and get it right the first time? Apparently, just get a couple students, give them a couple days. They're cheap. They don't have to have. <laughs> They don't have to have any experience at all, apparently. And the first time they ever used this method. It's incredible. All right, so uh, it turns out after the accident, someone actually took this result and conducted a test. Let's see. So we have a video. Maybe that would be a good test case to do earlier. The other problem is not that we have stupid testers. We have smart testers. And I'm sure they did a lot of testing on this. But things slip through the cracks. How can we be sure that we've got everything? We need better methods to be more careful and rigorous. Now, that's an interesting that one because that was a software interaction. Nothing failed, by the way. It's a little hard to argue that on a component scale, you pick any component on that car, it's really hard to say it failed because it acted exactly the way it was designed to, exactly the way every requirement said it should. Engineers wouldn't call that a failure. They'd say it worked as designed. We've got another problem somewhere. So we've got to get better at this stuff. Now here's, maybe I'll, just, I'll just skip that. Uh, okay. So here's an interesting one. Do we care about humans? We really need to care about humans. I'm going to try to convince you in about three slides. So here's what the students did. We told them in this project, you have to look at software, you have to look at humans. So they looked at humans. So there's a manual steering override in this car, OK? So how can that cause a problem? Let's look at some unsafe control actions here. How can the steering command be provided and cause an accident, the manual steering command? Well, essentially, if the human grabs the steering wheel, let's say you're in an automated mode, grab the steering wheel, everything's fine, but you grab it, and then you cause an accident. You swerve into some, other, some car. Why do we even care about that? You think that guy must have a suicide wish. That's not my problem. That's somebody else's problem. If they really want to kill themselves, let them. That's not the right approach. That's the component-based approach. That's the component failure approach applied to a human. We need to take a systems approach. We need to understand how our system can do things. If we're not looking for these things, we're looking carefully, we're not going to find them. So we would do this. We'd use this template. We would say, OK, what kind of beliefs would a human have when they do this? Right? Let's not just assume that we've got stupid drivers. Um, there are some smart drivers. Um, so what might they believe? Well, they might believe that it's no longer engaged. That's why they're taking over. They might believe it's doing something they don't want. That's why they take over. And if they're causing something unsafe, they probably don't realize it's unsafe. Right? So we can put about three or four fundamental beliefs, not a 100-page not a report here I'm talking about, a few bullet points. You say, OK, what kind of inputs does the driver have from, from normal driving and from the automation that might induce those beliefs? Here's what the students came up with. They found that this vehicle, when it's driving down the road, it has two cameras to follow the painted lines on the road. And, it, and if they diverge, what do you do? There's not a perfect answer, but the decision at the time was follow the one on the right. And so. They came up with a scenario where if you're driving down the road and if you have an off-ramp, this vehicle, the automation, will try to take the exit for you, following the line. In addition, it's got some smart logic in there to recognize speed limit signs and actually decelerate. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but up in Boston, nobody follows these speed limit signs. <laughs> but the automation will happily. And so let's piece this together. So that might explain the process model belief that I need to take over. 
one more piece is they don't know, know that what they're doing is unsafe. So you put it all together, here's what you get. Here's the uh, uh, automated vehicle that, with a human driver, and it tries to take the exit, tries to slow down on its own. Let's say there's a human driver behind us. That doesn't happen on highways, does it? We've got a human driver behind us, and the car's doing Now, what's the human driver going to do when the car starts taking the exit and slowing down? The human driver is going to say, oh, no, I don't want to take the exit. I'm going to want to go back in my lane. But where's the car at that instant when they take over, maybe? Right in your blind spot. Whoa. Is this really not our problem? We have constructed the perfect system to induce this scenario and set the driver up to fail. Every component worked the way we designed it, met every requirement we thought we needed in the system. And if we were doing requirements-based testing only, we would have passed every single test. In fact, if the car did anything else, we would have failed it and told them to go back and fix it. We've got to expand our scope a little bit. But we need methods. To do it, we can't just have smart people sit down and write these out for me. You use your brain. We need methods to, and guidance to do this carefully and rigorously, or things fall through the cracks. Here's an example similar to this. You see what happened? The software was driving the car. Why did it do this? It worked, didn't it? It followed the line. did exactly what it was designed to do. System testing is all about challenging the assumptions, the design, the requirements, everything is fair game. We've got to challenge it.